Good, good. Um, so, what time is it? Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you tonight about has been something that even before pastors asked me to speak tonight has been, you know, God's been dealing with me. That's pretty much what I always speak to you guys about, stuff that God's dealing with me. Not really dealing with me, but trying to get me to come up to a level that I don't, I've never been at. You know, I've been, I've been a Christian since I was six years old, and um, that's a long time to be a Christian and, and not have... I realized as he was teaching me this that I don't I have about this much of a grasp on this concept. And so I'm going to challenge you guys. I, I feel like I'm probably not the only person here tonight that that has that deals with this and um, needs a better concept on it. So I'm going to challenge you because there's going to be some things I say that your mind's going to go that that it makes sense. This isn't right. Can't that can't be. But I promise you, if you will listen with your heart that it will, it will resonate and it'll bear witness because it is God's word. Um, how many of you know he doesn't operate the way the world operates? You know, and we're born into this world. And so, you know, I've had many years of being accustomed to the way the world deals with things. And so we just learn. I found in my life that I start to view God the way I view things in the world without even realizing I'm doing it. And he is, he is so opposite of this world, and he does things so opposite that um, sometimes it takes him, I feel like that's what he's teaching me right now, or some things that I have, I, I have not realized um, how opposite he is. And so um, just bear with me, because I'm going to lay a foundation. I'm going to stick really close to my notes during the foundation part, because I feel like The foundation is so very, very important. Um, So first of all, how many of you have played sports or have played sports all through school or whatever? Um, So I played pretty much any sport they had available back then. They didn't have tons like they do now. But, you know, I mean, they just didn't offer the things. You know, now they have tennis and uh, soccer and all this stuff. They didn't have that when I was in school. They had, you know... And, and they didn't play year-round anything. You know, it was during the fall, early winter, it was basketball, you know. And, and then the spring and summer, it was, it was softball. And then in the early fall, it was volleyball or whatever. Anyway, so every season, I would just move to the next sport. And so um, one of my favorite one was probably, well... I don't know, I like softball too, but basketball. How many of you play basketball, like basketball? So I'm going to talk a little bit real quick about that. So I know you guys, you know, that play it, you guys know how important it is to be in position, right? To be in position. Whether you're playing man, whether you're playing zone, if you're playing man, your position is what? Between you, your, your, position, your position is you're between your man and the yeah. What happens if you get out of position when you're playing man? It, what does it leave? It leaves that man wide open to do what? Score. Score. So if you're playing zone and you're maybe you're, you know, bottom right on the post and you get out of position and you're, you end up up at the top of the key, what, what does that leave open? Basketball people, what does that leave open? The basket. It leaves the basket open. And so it, it enables people to score, right? And so it is important. And I remember my coach uh, in high school drilling that in us, stay in position, stay in position, don't get out of position. I mean, imagine like hockey. How many of you play hockey? I know Pastor Ben did. Probably one person here plays hockey, two people. The two Minnesota people play hockey, okay? Or not Minnesota. Yeah, you guys are from Minnesota. Um, so I know, you know, let's imagine the goalie. And I, I don't know hockey, but I'm pretty sure the goalie never leaves the goal. Is that correct? Okay. So if the goalie said, you know, forget this. I want to score once and just left the goal. I mean, that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? And so it is important. What do you say? No. <laughs> it's important that you stay in position when you're playing sports. And so we're going to talk tonight. Um, and it's what God's been talking to me about, about staying in position. It's going to be very different than what you think it is. But, um, you know, when sin entered the world, our position changed. How many of you know that? What was, what was our position before sin entered the world? Where were Adam and Eve? With God. Their position was in God. There was, there was um, amazing power and communion between them and God. They had, they, that position was there. But then when they sinned, that position changed, didn't it? And, and it changed for the worst. And a lot of, you know, a lot of chaos, uh, you know, happened after that. And so 
When sin entered the world, our position changed. How many of you know God is righteous? You know what righteous is? It says it's the character or quality of being right or just. God sets this bar because he lives by the standard that he sets. God lives by this standard. God is righteous. He doesn't set a standard for us that he, doesn't, that he does not live by all the time. So he lives by this standard. But the human race failed to live up to this standard, didn't we? You know, I mean, we, we point a finger at Adam and Eve, but you know what? I would have hated to be Adam and Eve because I would have probably sinned long before that. You know, uh, the human race, it is in our nature. It is in our nature. And so, but that's that. Okay. That's the stinky part. But it says Christ came because there was no man who could stand in the gap between God and man and be righteous. There was no one. None of us could stand in that gap. And so we know that Christ came as a substitute and took our sin on, that, on, on him for us. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Let's look at Isaiah uh, chapter 59. Isaiah 59 and it's verse 15. And I'm going to read this out of the message Bible. It says, God looked and saw evil looming on the horizon, so much evil and no sign of justice. He couldn't believe what he saw, not a soul around to correct this awful situation. So he did it himself. He took on the work of salvation, fueled by his own righteousness. He dressed in righteousness, put it on like a suit of armor, with salvation on his head like a helmet. He put on judgment like an overcoat and threw a cloak of passion across his shoulders." So because, because there was no one to fix the situation, God took it upon himself. And God put on what? What does it say he put on? He put on righteousness. And we're going to talk a little bit about the breastplate of righteousness tonight. And that is one thing that when, you know, any pastor or teacher would stand up here and talk about, I just didn't really comprehend what righteousness really was. You know, I, I didn't understand the depth of it. And I'll just be honest with you, I still don't understand the depth of it. It's not a concept that the world understands. It's not a concept that the world flows in. It's a concept that only God flows in. And so it is something that I, I'm learning on a daily basis. And so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about what he's been talking to me about tonight about it. How many of you know righteousness is a relative position? So remember I said get into position. Your position matters. Where you are, where you stand with God matters. And it's important that you're in position. So righteousness is a relative position. When you're righteous, it has to do with how you relate to someone else, especially a superior. When I relate to Christ, when I am, how many of you ever heard the term in Christ? When I am in Christ, you know what in Christ means? It means that I I recognize what he's done for me and I accept what he's done for me and I am in, I am locked in him because of what he did for me. That's what in Christ means. And so my position, when I relate to Christ and I am in my position, then I am automatically righteous because, because he is. If I am in Christ, doesn't that make sense? If I'm in Christ, he's righteous, therefore I'm righteous, right? All right, so prior to sending Jesus, we're going to go back a little bit. One of God's first steps in correcting our position, this was back in the old covenant, was the covenant that God made with Abram. Do you remember that? Let's, let's look at uh, Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 says, After all these things, this word of God came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield. Your reward will be grand. Abram said, God, master, what use are your gifts as long as I'm childless and Eleazar of Damascus is going to inherit everything? Abram continued, see, you've given me no children and now a mere house servant is going to get it all. Then God's message came, don't worry, he won't be your heir. A son from your body will be your heir. Then he took him outside and said, look at the sky, count the stars. Can you do it? Count your descendants. You're going to have a big family, Abram. And he believed, believed God, and he believed, believed God, and God declared him set right with God. Now, I don't know if you guys know the story of Abraham and know, Abraham, Abram was not a perfect person. 
He, you know, we think, oh, Father Abraham, he must have been really good for God to, you know, make him the father. He was not perfect. He was human, just like you and I, and he made mistakes, and he made some serious mistakes. One of the first things he did was um, in trying to bring God's promise, God promised him this, and in trying to bring this about in his own life, he slept with another woman, bringing a different child into the world, trying to bring about that promise on his own. Probably not wise, I wouldn't think. What do y'all think? Another time, out of fear for his own life, he gave his wife to another man. Even worse. He's getting worse and worse. He was not perfect. He made mistakes. He was not righteous on his own. However, in this passage, God said, God just made him a promise. Abram believed, and because he believed, God, he was set right with God. So that tells me something. That tells me that my righteousness, my position in God has absolutely nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with my goodness or my badness or my mistakes or my, it has nothing to do with me. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So when I choose to walk before God like Abraham did, when I choose to do what he did, I'm basically saying these three things in faith to God. I'm saying, God, you've created me. I'm here. The only reason I'm here is because you made me. Number two, you have every right to judge me by your standards. You have every right to tell me when something is right or wrong. And number three, and, when I, and I love this one, number three, when I fall short, I can't earn it back, but you make up the difference with your mercy. And that's what Abram was saying. I messed up, but I believe you. I believe that you said I can have what you said I can have. And God said, you are right with me. That, that's amazing to me because sometimes I don't feel right with God. How many of you, anybody here that you don't feel right with God? Maybe you walk into church, maybe you came in tonight and you don't feel right with God. Maybe it was hard to sing about Jesus. That was a powerful song. But when you don't feel right with him, don't you have a tendency to kind of shy away from talking to him or about him? I do. But Righteousness, and we're going to talk a little, I'm, I'm just setting a foundation, but righteousness has nothing. I just get this in your head as we go, because this is very hard for me to understand. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with you. If you were a Christian, raise your hand if you have given your heart to God, then you are righteous. Everybody say it. I am righteous. I am set right with God. Okay. All right, so... The next one is, and we, I talked about this, we cannot earn righteousness. Everybody say that. I can't earn it. That's good to know because sometimes I, I don't know what I do to earn it, you know? I'm not good enough. We can't be good enough for it. We cannot earn God's acceptance. And this is hard for me to understand because this is what I was talking about earlier. That is not the way the world operates, is it? How do you gain acceptance with other people? You're not just automatically accepted by your peers, are you? I, not very, I, I mean, I have a few friends that they're just very accepting people. But for the most part, people are accepted. We're accepted by other people, even our spouses, even, even as we do our children like this. We're accepted by what we do, our behavior, how good we are. You know, um, if we did something, you know, amazing, how we look, um, what, whatever, it, it's, all, it's all very conditional, our acceptance with other people. You know, when, we, um, when we're in school, it, it, well, this starts even younger, you know. We give candy to, or not candy, but maybe a Skittle, well, that's candy, a Skittle to our babies when they're potty training. Oh, you went poo-poo on the potty, you're just Skittle. Why? Because we're rewarding them for doing something good because we don't have to change a dirty diaper. It starts that young. When we get in school, we have sticker charts for, you know, rewards for bringing your homework, rewards for good behavior. They have charts. They move up and down. You're on, I'm on green today. I'm on, I remember my nephew would always come home and he's like, yes, I'm on yellow today. Well, yellow was the step right before red, but that was really good for him. Really good. So we celebrated when he was on yellow, but you know, it starts really young when, you know, that reward system, that acceptance system. How many of you ever felt not accepted by someone? Yeah. It's kind of stinks, doesn't it? it? It's a very heart. It hurts your heart when you feel unaccepted, you know? And in most of our relationships, this is the way it is. But that's not the way we receive acceptance from God at all. 
God does not care. Listen to what I'm saying and don't go off and say, Aaron said, God, don't care what I do. I can do whatever I want. I'm getting to, I'm getting somewhere, but God really doesn't care what you do. It has nothing. Your righteousness in him has nothing to do with what you do ever. What you've done in the past, what you're doing now, you're never going to earn more righteousness by being better. You're never going to lose righteousness by being worse. You are righteous. It is, it is a gift. You are righteous, okay? And I, I know I'm just repeating myself, but I've, I've repeated this. You can't even, I can't even tell you how many times I've meditated on this over the last few months. God trying to get this to me that it is not a reward system with me, Aaron. That's what he tells me. It is not a reward system. I, I'm not saying that God, I know we read in you know, the Bible and you know, Revelation rewards and all that, but your righteousness, your being right with God, it's not a reward system. It's, it's a matter of what you have, it's a matter of whether or not you believe God and have accepted that gift. That's all it, that's all it boils down to. And so, so how, how do we put ourselves? So there, this is a position. Righteousness is a position. We don't want to be out of position. We want to be in that position. And when we try to do things our own way and we try to earn it our own way, we are out of position and God can't do anything with your righteousness because it's nothing to him. God can't do anything with my righteousness, but he can do a lot with his. And so it's very important that I stay in that position. So how do I get in that position so that I receive acceptance from God? So number one, I have to recognize the awfulness of sin. I have to recognize that even one unaccounted sin is too many. Do you know that if, if, you, if you only sinned one time in your life, one time, we've done that, I've done that today, but let's just say there's somebody in here that they've sinned one time in your life. Do you know that not accepting Jesus as your Savior, that one sin is enough to send you to hell forever? That's the seriousness of sin. Sin was an issue. Sin is an issue. And, and God had to deal very, very harshly with that because God is absolute. Do you know what that means? God, God deals in absolutes. He, absolute means not diminished in any way. God is absolutely wise. He is absolutely holy. He is absolutely omnipotent. He is absolutely omnipresent. He is absolutely powerful. Therefore, he cannot accept sin or he would cease from being God. He can't. He can't tolerate it at all or he would cease being God. So we're in a predicament here. You know, Adam and Eve have sinned. This whole entire nation that, you know, God created, this whole entire people that God created are in a predicament because, he, you know, they can't, he can't accept their sin. They're sinning right and left. We're, talk, we're not talking about one sin. We're talking about all kinds of sin. They're sinning right and left. And here's God dealing in absolutes. And he cannot go back on his word. He cannot, cannot tolerate sin. But one other thing God is absolute in is he is absolute love. Absolute love. And he loved people. He loves his people. But he can't accept sin. And so he made a way to forgive their sin. You know, because God is absolutely fair. He's absolutely fair, just, and holy. Sin required a payment, right? And if he was going to hold the devil accountable for his sin, which he did, he's going to hold you accountable for your sin. He has to because he's fair and just. Aren't you glad he's fair and just, though? I'm so thankful he's fair and just. And so he had to hold me accountable for my sin. Listen to this statement. It says, one does not have enough good work to make us right with God because righteousness would then cease from being a gift and would become a paycheck that you earned. I, I don't want to earn a paycheck from God. I, I, I couldn't earn it. I, you know, I would be... <laughs> It would be bad if I had to earn that. Let's, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And this is in the Passion Translation. And it says, For by grace you have been saved by faith. Nothing you did could ever earn this salvation, for it was the love gift from God that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast, for salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. In Romans 3.10, it says, no one is righteous, not even one. Therefore, he demanded the death of his own son. That was the payment. For your sin, for my sin, because he couldn't tolerate it, 
The Bible said God so loved the world so much that he sent his son, the man we were just singing about. He sent his son to die for you, for, the, for your sins, for my sins, because he is just and fair, and somebody had to pay for it. I love this. It says, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. No, no, no. Well, let me read that one. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, for he made him, talking about Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All right, I'm going to read Romans 5, 15. And this is, I am reading a few out of the message. There's just some, you know, I don't always, I'm, I usually am in, I love the New Living Translation, but there's just something about the message sometimes when I read it that hits me so strong, the way they word it. And I love this passage in Romans 5. Romans 5, 15. It says, yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man sin, which we're talking about Adam, if one man sin put crowds of people at the dead end abyss of separation from God, that is, that's heavy. Just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. There's no comparison between that death dealing sin and this generous life giving gift. The verdict on that one sin was the death sentence. The verdict on the many sins that follow, this is our sins was this wonderful life sentence. If death got the upper hand through one man's wrongdoing, can you imagine the breathtaking recovery life makes? Absolute life in those who grasp with both hands this wildly extravagant life gift. Listen, look at this next part. This grand setting everything right that the one man, Jesus Christ, provides. So that's what he did for you guys, for, uh, for me. He set everything right. It goes back to what that, the scripture we were talking about with Abram, about righteousness. He was set right with God. That's what Jesus did for us. We were set right with God. We were in the right position. Sin entered, and then we were out of position. And Satan was scoring on us right and left. And, Jesus, and God, God was not pleased with that. And God did not want that for us. God wanted his best for us. So he sent his one and only son, the only person that had righteousness, the only person that could be righteous for us to, for, as a substitute for in our place, for our sins. And you guys know this. To set everything right. To set everything right on the earth. To set everything right in you. So you don't have to walk around in condemnation for your sins. Did you know you could have sinned sitting there a minute ago? And you, there is therefore no condemnation in those that are in Christ Jesus. None whatsoever. That's hard to accept because why? We operate on reward system. If you do something bad, what do you get? Disciplined. If you do something good, you get a reward. That's not how God works. You guys raised your hand. You've accepted Jesus as your Savior. You are in right standing with God. The end. Only because of what Jesus did for us. And this flies in the face with everything we believe, or everything we know of how we gain acceptance with other people in our lives, doesn't it? When I put my faith in him, he puts my sin behind him. They are no longer before his eyes, ever. And they no longer stand between me and God. That's why we can be free from condemnation. Um, Pastor Willie George said this, and this is kind of, you know, he said, this is going to blow some people's minds, but I'm going to say it. He said, there will be many of good people in hell because they trust in their own works. They don't understand the seriousness of the sin issue that the payment of sin is death. But there will also be many of forgiven sinners in heaven because they realized at some point that they were not worthy, that they were a sinner, asked for forgiveness and asked for acceptance. Your goodness alone will not let you go to heaven, will not, will not allow you to go to heaven. And so there will be people, really good people, that, you know, they, they, they played a good game. They followed the rules. They did everything that will not go to heaven, that will go to hell, because they did not deal with the sin issue and accept Jesus as the payment for their sin. And at the same time, there's going to be some really bad people. <laughs> there's going to be some people that have messed up their entire life and called on the name of Jesus at the last minute and are going to be in heaven because of that, because they realized he is the only way and he made payment for me. And that is hard. That is hard to accept, isn't it? 
That's, that's hard to even think about that, you know, well, I can live my whole life. I live my whole life good, and here's this person. Or, you know, well, imagine what, being that person. Thank God by the skin of their teeth. I mean, thank God that he gives us every opportunity, no matter what we've done. Because I promise you, you're not as good as you think you are. Saying that to me. I am not as good. I have not followed the rules like I think I have. And really, the rules are irrelevant. The rules are irrelevant to where I'm going and who I and whose I am and my righteousness. Irrelevant. Do I follow the rules? You bet. Most of the time. Not perfect. But I follow them because, you know, I love God. He's my example. I've given my heart to him. He's a rule-following God. He's a good father. I want to be good because I want to draw other people to him. It says it's the goodness of God that draws people to repentance, right? And so I'm, I, want to do, I want to do right because of that. But, I, but me doing right has nothing to do with my righteousness. Very weird concept, I know. All right, so just because you deal with sin, this is my next one, just because you deal with sin, how many of you still deal with sin? You've given your heart to Jesus, but you still deal with sin. Yeah. Just because you still deal with sin does not mean you aren't righteous. Just because you still deal with it. You may have given your heart to it. doesn't mean, you know, well, I used to tell the kids, uh, uh, and we still have this happen some back there, I, but I think our, uh, we've taught it often enough that they know, you know, every time we would give an, uh, a salvation call in kids, you know, the same 15 kids would raise their hand every week. They got saved every week. You know, and so we, you know, so, okay, there was some teaching we needed to do that you don't have to get saved over and over again. You know, you ask for forgiveness of the sin. You've not lost your salvation. You are still righteous with God, you know, um, but sometimes we, we feel that way too. We may not know, think we lost our salvation, but we come in here feeling beat down because we messed up. We did something wrong, treated somebody wrong, said something ugly, did something absolutely out of character and and we feel condemned for that, right? And so that the, the devil's very good at that. He'll try to condemn us of things we do and things we don't even do. Um, he will condemn us, obviously, of our sins. Um, he's going to condemn us for doing things. How many of you have ever, you know, been watching a sitcom on TV or something and you felt condemned because you really should be reading your Bible right now? Have you ever, you know, Willie George told a story, it was, and, I, and I, I can relate to this in so many ways, but he said when he got saved, he was in high school, and he said he was sitting at his lunch table, you know, in high school, so there's people everywhere, he's sitting there, and um, all of a sudden, he said he just heard in his, you know, mind, because it, was the, it wasn't God, you know, look around, look at all these people, they're all going to hell. They're all going to hell. What you need to do, Willie, is you need to stand up on this table right here in the middle of the lunchroom, and you need to tell them you're all going to hell, and I've got the answer. And he's like, I am not doing that. You know, he's like, no, that's not, I am not doing that. And he said he, he did not end up doing it, but he walked away for weeks feeling condemned because he didn't do something, because he didn't do it. That wasn't even God. God doesn't tell you to do stupid things. Now, sometimes God is going to tell you to step out and do something. But let's imagine this high school. You guys know high schoolers. If somebody you don't know stands up on a table and starts yelling, what are you going to do? I'm not going to go, oh, yes, Willie, yes, you're right, I need to. That's not going to happen. And so sometimes the devil condemns us. Um, he, it's not something we've done wrong, but condemns us for not being a good enough Christian. And he'll plant things like that. I remember, you know, um, in school, they had bring your Bible to school day. Well, it wasn't anything besides just carrying it. I didn't have time to read my Bible at school. I was going to class. So I'm just, I'm carrying my Bible to school. I'm carrying my Bible to school. There was no purpose in it other than almost a, a prod thing. Look how good I am. I'm carrying my Bible to school because I wasn't reading God's word or getting anything from it. And so the devil will condemn us of kind of some crazy things, I, feel, I believe. Um, you know, sometimes God may be leading you to do something. He may be leading you to turn the sitcom off and go, re go read your word. But did you know it's okay to watch TV every now and then? It really is okay. Don't feel condemned for doing things like that. Don't let the devil condemn you and beat you up and tell you you're not being perfect enough. You should, you should be witnessing to all those people. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. Maybe you should, but God does not. If you're feeling condemned, it is not God. When God leads, he doesn't lead with condemnation. He doesn't make you feel bad. He doesn't, he doesn't coerce you. 
It's a leading. It's a prompt. How, how many of you have ever truly been led by God? I mean, it's it, it's a. I mean, a leading is he's leading. It indicates that I'm following. When God's leading me, my heart is being drawn. Therefore, I'm following Him. I'm not over here hiding, going, I "Don't want to stand up on the table, God. Don't make me. Please, don't make me." No. When God's leading me, I'm I'm. My heart is pulled, and I want to do what He's asking me to do. Um. So God did not send Jesus to this earth to die for you so that you could walk in condemnation while you are here until you go to heaven. I don't want to walk in condemnation until I go to heaven. Did you know that God is pleased with you? God is happy. I'm going to skip down a little bit. God is pleased with you. Twice in my life I've had um, a minister speak a word over me, and, and twice it was that phrase, God is pleased with you, Aaron. And one time it was after a pretty big mess up. I was young, super young, and it was after I felt I was feeling a lot of condemnation because I had sinned and messed up, and I was feeling just deep condemnation. And so when he said, God is pleased with you, I was I was just in awe. And this, the other time was when I, I, I felt like I had done everything right, and I had, I had handled this situation correctly. And um, God, you know, the word was given to me that God is pleased with you. And so there was almost a God is pleased with me because I handled this situation correctly. And God quickly took me back to the first time he said he was pleased with me. And he said he was pleased with me the time I didn't handle things correctly. The time I s- messed up and sinned horribly bad. God said he was pleased with me. His pleasure with you, his pleasing in you has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with what, you, what you've done, whether you're good. God, God's not pleased with you because you were good, and he is not displeased with you. He is pleased with you, and he is pleased with you because when he looks at you, where are you? Where is your position? It is in. Is he pleased with his son? Did you know you're his, you're his son and daughter too? He is pleased with you. Well, you need to walk out of here with your head held high tonight. God is pleased with you. You are right with God tonight. You can lay your head down on your pillow and go to sleep in peace tonight knowing that you are right with him. That's a good place to be. That's a good feeling to have, isn't it? Uh, I remember even telling Rodney a few times when I was going through some stuff and um, kind of when you feel like you're really going through it and nothing's working out in your life, you know. Uh, I told him, I said, I just feel like God's punishing me. I said that out loud a few times, didn't I, Rodney? So I feel like, and I'm in it. I said, I feel like I'm being punished. I feel like God's punishing me for something I've done. I've done something wrong. I've done it. I was wrong. And I feel like God's punishing me. Did you know God does not punish you? He punished one time. He punished his son one time for you. He will not punish again. He is not your punisher. And so don't ever feel like if something cruddy is going on in your life, because what, what does the Bible say? It says every good gift comes from who? That tells me every bad gift comes from, that nothing bad in my life comes from God. God does not punish me. Okay? Um, how many of you ever heard the, fa- the phrase, uh, God's favor is on you? I'm going to be honest with you. I, I have never cared for that phrase. I, have no, I don't like it because to me it, it denoted that, and I had a friend that would always say, I'm God's favorite. God's favor's on me. God's favor's on me. God's favor's on me. And yeah, things worked out in her life. I mean, she had a great, you know, and I'm like, so it, you know, I was just like, this doesn't compute because I know that God, that God said he's not a respecter of persons. And I know that we're all his children. And I know I do not have a favorite child, no matter what Kennedy or Gabby will tell you that Josh was my favorite. I do not have a favorite child and, and God does not have a favorite child. He is no respecter of persons. So this didn't compute that God's favor was on Mona. Did you know God's favor is on his children? And it, if, you, if, if it's apparent, if it's more apparent in someone's life, it's because they have chosen to accept that. It's because they've chosen to believe it. It's just like everything else we receive. Every other promise we receive in God's word is by faith, by believing. And so if, God, if I believe God's favor is on my life, I'll tell you, my middle child... She, she's one that thinks God is, that she is God's favorite. I promise you. She, huh? She says it. And she says, you know, everything works out for her. And I'm not kidding. The girl 
does walk in favor with God. She just, you know, things work out. Uh, her driving test, we were, Joshua just took his driving, his written test passed. Woo woo, Joshua, finally. Um, he's going to be driving soon. Um, but when Gabby took it, we were living in Oklahoma City, and uh, she had to take her driving portion in Oklahoma City as well. And so um, she hadn't practiced hardly any Rodney, do you think, at all? Uh, so I, I had taken Joshua to the water park that day, and I was like, she is, you know, I didn't say it out loud, but she is not going to pass. There's no way she's going to pass this drive test. Because not only was it in a big city, it wasn't even Oklahoma City. We, we had to call around to, because it was right before we were moving back here, and if she didn't get her license in Oklahoma, she was going to have to start the whole process over in Arkansas. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, it was like a week, and, and you know, they were booked. You have to make appointments to get in. And so where did she take it? Huh? Lawton. Lawton. We drove, Rodney drove her to Lawton. They have never, we've never been to Lawton to take her test. So she had to drive in a city she had never been in. I'm like, she is not passing this test. So where I'm at the water park with Josh when I get a call and yeah, she passed. You know why though? Because she told me, mom, I'm a good driver. I am an excellent driver. And, and you know, God's favor is on me. I'm over and over and over. And I'm like, I know, sis, but you really should practice too. You know, I'm just like, come on. You know, no, nope, she passed flying colors. And that's just the way some things have happened in her life. And so sometimes we look at people and go, God's favor is just on them. They get to do everything. They, they don't seem to have any worries. They, you know, they have all the money in the world. God's favor just rests on them. And I struggle. Okay. Well, let's look at what I just said. <laughs> Because God does not favor one child over the other because it doesn't matter. God does not favor pastors over uh, the people working in the nursery. He doesn't favor the people that did something right today over the people that did something wrong. He favors you because you are his child, because you are in Christ. And it is a matter of you deciding you're going to believe it. Just like Abram said when he told Abram, you're going to be the father of all these children. Abram could have went, yeah, right. But he said, I believe it. And God said, you are right with me. So when I believe that I have favor, that I am God's favorite, maybe not favorite, but I'm his fa- I am favored, I'm right with God. Okay, so real quick, we've got a couple more points, and I'll be done here in a couple of minutes. What do you do when you fall short? Because we talked about, you know, we mess up still, so what do you do? You know, when most Christians sin and fall short, what do we do? What do you do when you mess up? Back row, exactly. Who hide? You hide. You don't. You don't want to be up front and center. You don't want to. You don't want to talk to God. You. You tend to shy away, just like kids do when they mess up. They don't want to come and tell their parents, so they hide it. When we mess up, we have a tendency to hide, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. Uh, we punish ourselves sometimes until we feel like we've done enough. I think. I think it was you that said penance. I gotta. I got to do enough. I messed up this much, so I got to do at least this much to make up for it. That's not the way God works. The minute you sin, the Bible says you need to admit it to God. In fact, in 1 John 1, 9, this is a New King, uh, New King James Version. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when you come to God immediately... The slip-ups and the failures, did you know they become fewer? When you, when you learn to come, because when you come to God, he helps you. He corrects you. He teaches you. And those slip-ups become fewer. It's just like a baby. You know, when a baby's learning to walk, they don't start off walking first. You're not getting everything right first. They start off scooting, crawling, and eventually they're up and walking. And that's just the way it is in our Christian walk. It's called growing in grace, isn't it? Okay, so the last point is, so we're going to walk out of here, and everybody's going to be super happy because we are in right standing with God. God is pleased with you. If I could recall out every one of your names, I would tell you that tonight. I don't care what you did. I don't care what you haven't done. I don't care how you've disobeyed or whether you have obeyed. God is very, so much pleased with you tonight. So be at rest. Know that you can go to him and ask him anything. Know that you can go to him and admit anything. Because he is pleased with you tonight. Okay? The, next, the last point I want to talk about is everybody look around. Make eye contact with some people. All these people that raise their hands in here, God's pleased with them too. They're righteous too. 
And so the same, the same things that we've been forgiven of, the same things that we walk in righteousness with. You know, I was, I was looking at uh, Sarah Balo on stage earlier, and I was thinking how pretty she looked tonight. And then I was thinking, you know, I don't know her very well, but she seems so nice, a just super nice lady. And God began, as I've been studying this, God's began to open the eyes of my heart towards other people. Instead of just seeing Joni, I've known Joni for blah, 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 so many years, and that Sarah, I haven't really known her. Instead of seeing it, God's opened my eyes to see people the way he sees them. And I'm, at, I'm, and I'm talking just a little bit. I'm asking him to open them wide so that I can see people the way he sees them, so I can see the good in people the way he sees the good in people, so I can see Christ in people the way he sees them. So that I can look and go, you are righteous. I don't care if, you know, my, you know, my own kids, I don't care if you've messed up. I don't care what you've done. So I can see the righteousness of them. Because when I see righteousness in people, remember righteousness is right standing with God regardless of what you've done. When I see righteousness in people, it enables me to, first of all, love them correctly. And then it enables me to minister to them correctly. If I, you know, especially as a parent, if I don't see the righteousness in my children, then I'm going to be a very harsh parent. And I feel like I've done that some to my kids because I'm going to expect a level of that. I'm going to, I'm going to expect them to operate at a level. And when they don't, I'm going to be disappointed because they didn't hit the mark. Well, let me tell you, I did not hit the mark either. I do not hit the mark. I, we, I do not measure up because we, we heard earlier sin, just one sin. I don't hit the mark. Well, neither do your kids. Neither, do, neither does your spouse. Neither do anybody in here. Neither do your pastors. None of us hit the mark, but we are righteous. And so when we view each other that way and when, when we're able to view each other the way God does, and it, it, it opens up, um, it, it kind of shuts down the devil's plan because, yeah, in here, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure most, almost everybody raised their hand that they were saved. So in here, we're not, it's not a mission field of salvation, but did you know it is a huge field in here that Satan can have a, a way with if we allow him to, if we don't see the righteousness, if I don't see the righteousness in Pastor Ben, then I can get sideways with him real quick. Uh, something he does, you know, or doesn't do right. Or, oh my gosh, did you see what Pastor Ben did or how he didn't talk to me? I can get super sideways with him if I don't see the righteousness in him. And that's the devil's plan, is to get us all mixed up with each other so that when we go out of here, we, we definitely aren't seeing the people that need righteousness. We're not even, we're, our heads are not even up because we're so in here thinking about what so-and-so did and didn't do and da 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 and when, but when we are able to get through and past all of that, and, and just asking God, I was walking today after work, and I was praying, and I was asking God to just open my eyes, uh, and that's been a prayer of mine a lot, to open my eyes even more. I want to see people the way God sees them, because when I do, I, I don't know that I ever have, because I'm telling you, I, the God that, that did all of this that's not the way I operate. I still operate in rewards and all that. I still, I still view people based on what they did. I still accept people based on what they did or didn't do to me. Or I don't accept them based on what they did or did, didn't do to me. I still deal with that. So I know I'm not there yet at all. And so that is a daily prayer of mine. I want to see people the way you see them, God. Because then I'm not going to get my, myself all up and hurt just every time somebody looks cross-eyed at me, I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to allow myself to, um, to get caught up in the, in Satan's mess that he tries to get us caught up in with each other. Because, like he, like I said, if he keeps us busy in here, we don't have time for anybody out there, and those people need us. You know, I was. Um, I don't think Tom and Becky are in here, are they? Tom is okay. So when I was praying an earlier day, and I was going to tell. Tom and Becky this tonight, but um, I was I was thinking about heaven, and uh, I don't know if you guys know, knew his, their son Peyton. Mm, mm, I love that kid, and you know God God prompted in me, so I want you to tell this Becky uh, tell this to Becky Tom. God 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 just said I heard it so loud and clear. It's not much longer. It's not much longer, Tom and Becky. We're gonna see that that boy again because I'm telling you. Oh, 
Well, he was, oh, you, I, I can't wait till those of you that don't know him meet him because he was amazing. But I think about heaven and I think about how amazing it's going to be to see people we haven't seen in a long time. And then I started thinking about all the people that aren't going and aren't going to be there ever, ever, ever. People I know, people I pass every day. People that need to be righteous, and it's so easy. People that don't feel like they can be because of what they've done. They've done. People that haven't been told. It doesn't matter what you've done. It's so vital that we keep our minds and our eyes open to the people around us. And the only way we're going to do that is, first of all, number one, believing that you are righteous. God's pleased with you. God's pleased with you. Every day you wake up, God's pleased with you. But he's also pleased with the people around you. Your, bro- your brothers and sisters in Christ, he's very pleased with. So get over it. Whatever it is that you have with each other, get over it. We don't have time for it. We, we've got, we got other people to take to heaven because I want them to all meet Peyton too because he is hilarious. He will, and I want them to meet your grandma and grandpa. And I want them to meet their grandma and grandpa that are in heaven. Wouldn't that be sad for grandma and grandpa to be in heaven and their grandkids not? We all need to go. And it's all vital that we, that we operate um, the way God wanted us to operate, with our eyes wide open, seeing people the way he sees them. Because the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loved you before you did anything. God loved you. And God loves the people out there. And so um, that's pretty much it tonight, I think. I wanted to hang on. Let me look. Let me read this back one. Oh, I put, this is kind of an everyone gets a trophy message. I hate that. I hate in sports where everybody gets a trophy. I hate when everybody gets a ring, but that's kind of what this is. And you know what? That's how God operates. Here's your ring. Here's your trophy. Do you want it? It's yours. Righteousness, it's yours. It's yours. It's a gift. Doesn't matter. Well, I didn't play very well tonight. Well, I didn't play at all. I'm just the water boy. Well, I didn't. I'm not even, you know, it doesn't matter. We all get the trophy. We all get it. He's so very pleased with us that he wants us all to get the trophy or the ring or whatever it is. You know, um, earlier I talked about uh, the breastplate of righteousness and it talked about Jesus. It says that Jesus... He put on, and you know, and when it's talking about the armor of God, which the breastplate of righteousness is one part of it, it talks about we have to put on the armor of God. Um, I believe that you know, it's not like it's it's not saying that every day you know you have to put on righteousness. You're not righteous. <laughs> it doesn't mean you lose your righteousness. Your righteousness is because of who the position you're in, which is in Christ. But we do have to put it on because we can operate. How many of you have ever been given a gift but you didn't use it? If you don't use something, if it just sits there and you don't use it, it's not really doing you any good. Or if you don't open it, or if you choose not to accept it. But we've accepted. We've, we, we said we've all accepted it. And so every day when we put on what it's talking about, when we put on that breastplate, it's basically just reminding yourself, put it on. Every morning when you get up, look in the mirror and say, God's pleased with you, Jenna. God's pleased. God's pleased with you. God's pleased with you, Aaron. Yeah, but I watched that show. God is pleased with you. Now, go do what I'm telling you to do. Go minister to the people I'm telling you to minister to this morning. Tonight, whatever it is. (laughs) Um, Anyway, that's what God's talking to me about. And I I guess that's why I said it is a hard concept for me. Because um, I'm a type A personality. And so I'm always, you know, in, in school... I didn't get in trouble. I didn't, I didn't do it. I just did not want to do anything wrong. I wanted to do everything right. Um, my husband can tell you how many licks he had. After service, anybody want to know? I can't tell you how many times he was in the principal's office. So, But I wanted to do everything right. And so that's very hard for me to accept that God, God doesn't care. He wants you to do right. And we know that he wants you to do right because there's a hurting and dying world that needs you. And that's part of it. <laughs> but your salvation, your righteousness is not contingent on that. 
and he needs you to know that. And uh, that, that was hard for me to, to believe or understand because I, I still am, you know, amazed as I was walking today. I just told God, I said, I'm, I'm amazed that um, you loved me so much. You were willing to give me righteousness when I didn't earn it or deserve it. There's nothing I did. There's nothing I do. There's nothing I could ever do. That amazes me um, because that God, you know, the world just doesn't give out rewards for nothing. But God does. What can you believe God for? What can you believe God for? His favor rests on you. I'm going to start believing God for more. I want, I, want to, I want to be like my middle daughter that walks around and thinks that she's God's gift to this earth. <laughs> I want to be like that. I want to walk in that favor. Um, and it's a matter of my choice. It's a, matter of what, it's a matter of what I can believe God for. Just like Abram, I want, to, I want, to, I want him to say, and Aaron believed. I want, it, I want it to be written one day. And Aaron believed. And all of this happened because of that. Don't you want that? Anyway, um, that's it tonight, guys. Um, I'm closing. I don't usually do that. But um, is there anything? Nope. Like he said, next Wednesday night, we're going to be at the water park. And pastors will be back Sunday. So love you guys. Go out.